Have you ever encountered something so extraordinary that it feels like it belongs in a treasure hunt movie? Well, brace yourself, because what I'm about to share is no work of fiction. It's a reality as mystifying as it is intriguing. The Ethiopian Bible stands as one of the most enigmatic and debated texts in history. Ethiopia itself is a land steeped in mysteries that defy explanation, but that's a tale for another time. As one of the oldest civilizations on Earth, and the only African nation never to be colonized, Ethiopia's history stretches back to the ancient lineage of Ham, one of Noah's sons, a connection even acknowledged by the Jewish tradition. But today, we turn our attention not to the country, but to the treasure it holds. Ethiopia is home to some of the oldest biblical scrolls in existence, predating even the revered King James Version. While the King James Bible consists of 66 books, the Ethiopian Bible boasts 88, including texts that are absent from other Christian canons. These ancient scrolls contain writings from the Old and New Testaments, as well as works that were once hidden from the world. What makes this all the more fascinating is that Ethiopia possessed these scrolls long before Christianity officially arrived in the country in the 4th century. In other words, Christianity wasn't introduced to Ethiopia as it was to many other nations. It was already present there, embedded in its very fabric. Since the 4th century, Ethiopia has been a stronghold of Christianity, a fact noted by the Egyptian traveler and historian Cosmos Indicopolists, who documented Ethiopia's Christian heritage during his visit in the mid-6th century. He witnessed the rulers of Ethiopia opening their borders to Christian refugees fleeing persecution from empires and kingdoms that sought to crush the faith. For centuries, certain Ethiopian tribes have worshipped the Christian god, a devotion stretching back an astonishing 3,500 years. Contrary to what many believe, the oldest organized Christian body in the world isn't the Catholic Church, but the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, known locally as Tawado. Ethiopia is home to one of the earliest illustrated Christian texts ever discovered, a piece of the Gospels written in Gs, an ancient Ethiopian language. This incredible find was unearthed in 2010, hidden in a monastery perched atop a remote mountain. According to the Kebernagist, a sacred Ethiopian text, the story goes that in the 10th century BC, the legendary Queen of Sheba traveled to Jerusalem to seek the wisdom of King Solomon. While the Bible acknowledges this meeting, it leaves out a crucial detail. The two rulers had a son named Menelik. Queen Sheba brought Menelik back to Ethiopia where he became the nation's first emperor, forever linking Ethiopia's royal lineage to the House of David. In 2012, researchers delved into the genetic makeup of Ethiopians and uncovered evidence that supports the legendary journey of Queen Sheba to Jerusalem and the birth of her son there. Their findings suggest that around 3,000 years ago, during the time of Sheba's reign, Egyptian, Israeli, or Syrian peoples may have intermingled with the native Ethiopians, adding yet another layer of credibility to the ancient story. Yet, despite its rich history and authenticity, the Ethiopian Bible remains largely ignored, excluded from the canon of holy texts recognized by much of the world. Shockingly, even many believers of the Christian faith are unaware of its existence. This raises a significant question. Why has the Ethiopian Bible been so thoroughly discredited and hidden? To grasp the answer, we must take a step back in history. The Bible, as we know it today, is not exactly as it was in ancient times. There were numerous versions, with different parts of the Bible, various interpretations and ideas about its meaning. Originally written in Hebrew, the Bible underwent countless translations and adaptations as it spread across the globe, evolving into the form most people are familiar with today. The first significant translation of the Bible was undertaken by a man named St. Jerome, who translated the scriptures from Hebrew to Latin, creating what we now know as the Vulgate around the year 400. The Vulgate remains the principal Latin version of the Bible, containing 27 books of the New Testament and 39 books of the Old Testament, what was then referred to as the Hebrew Bible. In the early centuries, countless books were written about the life and teachings of Jesus, However, not all of these accounts were genuine. Many were more like fan fiction, stories crafted by various authors that strayed far from the truth. The trouble was, without the internet or any means for quick fact-checking, 
These fictional accounts spread rapidly and were often mistaken for reality. As we all know, fake news tends to travel faster than the truth, and in those days, the sheer volume of false accounts circulating through society caused significant confusion and misinformation about the life of Jesus. This growing confusion alarmed the early Christian leaders, prompting them to take action. In 325 Ed, they convened at the Council of Micaiah, and later at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 Ed, to address the chaos surrounding the many books about Jesus. Their goal was to determine which texts should be included in the New Testament. To be considered scripture, a book needed to meet specific criteria. It had to be written by one of Jesus' followers or someone who had witnessed his teachings firsthand. Additionally, the text had to be composed in the first century and aligned with the rest of the Bible. Over the centuries, the Bible has undergone numerous changes, but perhaps the most significant transformation occurred during the reign of King James I. Even though the Vulgate had been the standard for over 500 years, there were still countless versions and interpretations of the Bible circulating, causing enough concern to catch the attention of the monarch himself. King James was deeply concerned about the various versions of the Bible circulating in the 1600s. He sought a unified version that would not only settle religious disputes, but also bolster his authority. Many priests had also urged the king to take action, arguing that some of the existing translations were flawed. To address this critical issue, the king assembled 47 scholars and experts to review the many translations of the Bible already in existence. These scholars were divided into six groups, each tasked with working on different sections of the project independently over a span of seven years. To ensure fairness, the scholars adhered to strict guidelines that prevented any bias from creeping into their work. They employed a variety of tools and methods to produce a translation that remained true to the original languages. When the king and the priests reviewed the scholars' work, they were struck by the remarkable consistency among the groups, despite their separation. Interpreting this as divine guidance, they approved the new version, praising God for leading them to a unified and accurate translation. In 1611, the King James Bible was published, and thanks to advancements in printing technology, it quickly became one of the most widely accessible Bible versions ever produced. However, the edits made during the creation of the King James Bible, along with the original Vulgate translation by St. Jerome, led to the exclusion of certain books that are absent in most Bibles today. Meanwhile, the Ethiopian Bible still retains all of its original scriptures. Now that we've explored the history of the Bible, let's tackle the key question. Why was the Ethiopian Bible rejected by mainstream Christianity? The primary reason lies in the fact that the Ethiopian Bible includes additional books known as pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha are works falsely attributed to notable figures from the past, often claiming to be written by someone other than the true author. Much like fan fiction, these texts are considered non-canonical by most other Christian traditions, leading to their exclusion from the accepted biblical canon. The books that were removed or rejected were those that scholars and theologians of the time recognized as not being divinely inspired. These texts were often written by individuals with questionable motives, both before and after Jesus' time. While it's understandable why these writings were excluded, let's consider an analogy. Imagine if someone today published a book claiming that Kobe Bryant wasn't a great athlete. Such a book would be met with widespread ridicule and backlash, because we all know it's untrue. However, if that book somehow survived for 500 years, people in the distant future might stumble upon it and begin to question whether Kobe Bryant was indeed as legendary as history remembers. To prevent such falsehoods from distorting the truth over time, we take action now to eliminate them before they can take root and spread into the future. The Ethiopian Bible is divided into two canons, the broader and the narrow. But before diving into these, let's clarify what a canon is. A canon is essentially a set of accepted rules or criteria used to judge or define something. For example, it's a canon that a phone has one screen, a country has one president, and this channel aims to gain more subscribers. In the broader, more well-known canon of the Ethiopian Bible, there are 81 books. This version includes texts like Enoch, the Jubilees, the Three Books of Maccabees, 
the Epistle to Clement, four books of Synodos, and many more. This is the version that's often discussed and recognized. The narrower canon, however, was established under Emperor Hale Selassie. He officially declared this version as the definitive Ethiopian Bible. As for why there's a difference between the two canons, I'll leave that for you to research on your own. It's a topic that could spark debate, so I suggest looking up Hale Selassie and exploring the details for yourself to uncover the full story. The narrow canon of the Ethiopian Bible contains 72 books, missing some of the scriptures found in the broader version, which has 81. While the broader canon includes everything in the narrower one and more, it hasn't been reprinted since the early 20th century. This disparity highlights inherent controversies, and having two different versions likely contributed to the Ethiopian Bible's lack of broader acceptance. The Ethiopian canon provides a fascinating glimpse into how the Bible has evolved over time. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible isn't just a single book, but a collection of texts accumulated over many years. This is where the complexity arises. Different religious groups have historically included or excluded texts based on various theological and personal reasons. For instance, the Bible we recognize today was primarily compiled in the 4th and 5th centuries AD. By then, Christianity in Ethiopia had already started to diverge from the versions practiced in Europe and the Mediterranean region, and these differences have only grown more pronounced over time. The Ethiopian Bible shares many similarities with the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, but it also includes a few extra books from the Old Testament. These additional texts were likely written in the last few centuries before the New Testament began, providing a bridge between the two. At the end of the New Testament, the Ethiopian Bible also includes books that focus on the history and organization of the Ethiopian Church. The language of the Ethiopian Bible, Gs, adds another layer of complexity. Since Gs is not widely spoken today, this makes the Bible less accessible to those unfamiliar with it. Furthermore, the absence of translations and the unique practices associated with the Ethiopian Bible have contributed to its relative obscurity beyond Ethiopia's borders. A more controversial reason for its rejection involves politics. In the early days of Christianity, Roman emperors were more concerned with political power than spiritual matters. As a result, any texts that did not align with their preferred narrative were excluded from the canon. In fact, the Bishop of Rome once instructed priests to destroy any scrolls not included in the Bible. Fortunately, the priests were clever and hid many of these texts in jars near the Dead Sea, which were discovered in the 1940s. This find helps explain the differences between the versions of the Bible we have today. One version is often seen as the complete Bible, while the other represents what was deemed acceptable by later standards. However, in recent years, interest in the Ethiopian Bible has surged as people seek to uncover its unique aspects and the truths it holds. Ethiopian churches have been working diligently to make this ancient text more accessible, translating it into various languages and conducting scholarly research. It's remarkable that this Bible has withstood so much over the centuries, surviving invasions by Muslims in Italy, as well as a fire that ravaged the monastery housing it in the 1930s. Its survival through these trials only deepens the mystery and significance of this extraordinary book. Please share your thoughts with us in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell icon to be notified of new uploads.